let's go over the overview of Rust. So for origin, it was created by Graydon Hoare at Mozilla Research around 2010. Graydon Hoare was a developer at Mozilla who needed a safer systems language. Uh, he began working on Rust as a personal project in around 2006. Uh, first prototypes implemented around 2008 to 2010 and officially announced Rust project in 2010. So he spent first, uh, I mean, spent over five years in development, testing, and tool building. Uh, that's even though if it was announced in 2010, the first table 1.0 release was in 2015. Uh, 1.0 release milestone indicated stability for real production use. The design goals uh, first is the speed high performance comparable to almost C and C++, intended to be a systems language usable for tasks traditionally done in C, C++. Uh, it achieves uh, high runtime performance through zero cost abstractions and also compiles to native code with low level control and manual memory management. Now, as per safety goes, uh, its type system prevents memory errors like buffer overflows. It has a strong type system uh, which tracks object lifetime ownership to prevent unsafe behavior. There's no null pointers, uh, iterator bound checks, no data races. Uh, that's why it's more safe. Uh, for It also forces handling of errors instead of ignoring them. Uh, and then for concurrency, it's built-in support for parallelism and concurrency. It's very lightweight uh, tasks and message passing built into the language. So that's why it's much better in concurrent uh, programming. Its type system protects against race conditions. Uh, and then also it's easy to write concurrent programs that are safe and uh, correct. For the reliability, it's uh, rich error handling and minimal runtime crashes. Its errors must be handled instead of ignored. Uh, you also have results in fewer crashes in production, uh, which this particular thing uh, being reliable. So you don't have crashes or any other causes because you're handling the errors. Debugging is easier uh, with well-typed program state. Uh, for the productivity, it's high level abstractions as uses the cargo package manager, it's expressive traits and Generics encourage code reuse. Also, it has great documentation and tools. Uh, cargo provides dependency management and build tools. For influences, uh, emphasizes zero cost abstraction like C++, it's idiomatic. Rust aims to have no runtime cost for abstraction use. Also, goal is to provide useful programming models with uh, performance of manual C code. The memory safety without garbage collection like Swift and OCaml uh, use uh, are all patterns uh, instead of GC for memory management. Um, that's why it's memory safety. Uh, Compiler tracks lifetime and ownership static statically, uh, so it's much more safe. Uh, functional uh, influences from Haskell, ML, Scala, so the purity and uh, isolation supported but is not enforced. There's also type inference, pattern matching, and enum variants. For the evolution of this, uh, initially sponsored by Mozilla, significant uh, external contributions. Mozilla pays core team, but much work is done by the community, uh, allows for the default open development model. Uh, also a rapid evolution and improvement of language tools, breaking changes uh, routinely uh, introduced to the language. There's also cargo toolchain rapidly being improved. Another strong focus on community building, it's inclusive, pragmatic philosophy, uh, kind of helps people to kind of uh, get in and then work on making it better. Emphasis on the education, documentation, and governance. Uh, so as per the philosophy goes, it's fast, safe, productive. You pick three. So setting Rust apart is the combination and balanced trade-offs. Also, other languages may excel at one or two, but rarely all three. And that's why it's fast, safe, and productive. Now for balancing performance versus safety productivity, a zero cost principle, but resists uh, on premature optimization. There's also pragmat pragmatically uh, trades off between uh, the bound checked arrays versus unsafe ones. For concurrency without fear, language uh, features allow uh, easy concurrent code and also stability and isolation between all the tasks. The applications, some of the applications include like system programming where you do OS embedded and drivers where you replace the C for performance critical task, uh, NASA, Microsoft, Dropbox, Cloudflare, uh, use, they use Rust. Also for web services and uh, network programming with high performance, high concurrency backends supported by frameworks like uh, Actix and Rocket. Uh, 
also has high performance computing for games simulators scientific often uh, of often needs both performance and parallelism that's why it's used there uh, these are some of uh, the overview of uh, of of rust will probably get into installation and uh, uh, writing your first applications soon let's go ahead and uh, install rust so now to install rust you can go to the rustlang.org the official website this video was recorded in february 2024 so it might have changed from the version that we have so it's better to just go and uh, look at the most updated website you can click on get started once you're there yeah, there is an option to try rust without installing if you want to play around with it uh, if you follow the course that we are going through you can go through this video series or you can use the same thing here without installing on your computer so this is an easier way to do that and if you are not if you want to install let's go back and uh, install so first step it says is take this and go ahead to your terminal and run this code so i'm going to go ahead and run this it's going to say run installer i'm going to click on one proceed with installation if you want to customize or cancel you can press the other options so it's going to go ahead and it's going to take some time to download it so give it some time and once it's done it will be installed so it took like a couple of minutes and it's then it says rust is installed depending on your internet speed it might take more or less it's been installed it says you get started you want to restart this cell uh, this particular shell and uh, this would reload your path environment and include everything that we need for cargo and we'll talk about cargo a little bit more but this kind of shows that your uh, rust is being installed so other than installing Rust, we also need Cargo. Now if you look at it, it says that Cargo, when you install Rust, you'll also get the latest stable version of Rust build tools and package manager, also known as Cargo. Cargo does a lot of things, which is all these things, which you'll probably see when we actually uh, build some applications. So once we install this, uh, there's also a way to check if your Rust is up to date. You can just say Rust update and it will update rust for you rust up update sorry and then uh, you can read the cargo uh, book that is also available here other tools that are available is vs code sublime text we'll probably use depending on which id you you like you can uh, pick that editor and then uh, start working uh, alongside with us for the next step let's create our first uh, hello world project using rust so in the same page where you installed there's also a generating a new project example you can follow this we're going to use the package manager cargo and just follow along with this so i'm going to go to my terminal i'll go to a folder called as rust projects and enter this command this creates my hello rust package i can go to the folder and i'll see that that is created now I can open it in sublime text that's what I'm going to use for this particular project and if you see here it says that the files that we have here SRC the main file this is the main application file right here it says that there is also a manifest file here which talks more about the project with the project metadata it has the package name version edition uh, it also has a comment here and uh, if you want to add dependencies this is where you can add it now to run this project what we can do is go here so let's run our very first project if you see what it does is call the main function and call will print hello world so i'm going to say cargo actually first let's see where i am so let's go inside the folder of the project and then i'll say cargo run it's compiled, finished, and if you see the output is there, you can change it to whatever you want. Print my name, change that, run it, and there you go. That's your first project in Rust that you've implemented. It's pretty straightforward. If you see, just give it a try. Welcome to Rust Basics. In this particular video, uh, what we are going to look at is some of the basic concepts in Rust, which are variables and mutability, variable bindings, data types, functions, control flow and modules. 
I'm not going to go over the definitions of this, but I'm going to jump straight into these uh, how to code them. So I'm going to open my Rust project. So I have it open here from our last video. I'm going to make sure that it runs. I'll go and say cargo run and it prints hello webinar run based on what we have here. Now let's go with the first one. First one I want to cover is variables and its mutability. So in Rust, variables are immutable by default. That means once a value is bound to a name, you cannot change that value. Uh, you can use the let keyword to define the immutable bindings. To make a variable mutable, you use uh, the mut keyword, keyword or the mute keyword. Let's look at let's look at how that mute keyword is used. But first, let's create a variable. I'm going to say x equal to five. Now this x is immutable variable binding x has unchangeable value of 5 so you can't actually change it next uh, let's see how let i'm gonna say so if i say similar thing to y equal to 10 now this is uh, immutable but if i want to make it mutable i just say mut in front of it and that will make it mutable mutable variable y starts as i mean value 10 but can be changed so i can go ahead and say y equal to 15 in the next line uh, so it the value of y now is 15 i can print ln function and i say x is this and y is this x comma y and then i just go ahead and run the and you will see that it says x is 5, y is 15, the value of y exchange of course is going to give you some warning messages here, unnecessary trailing semicolon, so it looks like I'll go over there to get rid of it, sometimes you do it too much, y is, maybe it's overwritten before being read, so if you see y, I'm assigning a value and I'm saying why are you changing it in the next line, so it's just giving you some warnings, but that's fine, uh, It's that's, that's how variable and mutability works now next thing that we want to look at is uh, variables variables bindings now in uh, rust distinguishes between copy bindings and move bindings uh, simple values like integers are copied so when you assign x equal to something and you assign y to x what it does is it just do does a copy of that and uh, does copy binding Whereas uh, complex resources like strings are moved between uh, between bindings. So what happens is, let me give you an example. Let x equal to 10. I'm going to remove this or else it will cause problem because of the same variable names. So I'm going to say x equal to 10. When I say let y equal to x, what it does, it keeps both x and y, but it just makes a copy of y's value into x. But if you use something like a string, this is how we define a string and we'll look at more on these later. I am saying S is string which has value rust. That's what I'm saying here. Now when I say let T equal to S, what happens in this case is uh, this is a move binding. Where, so S is invalid now. So S doesn't have a value. It moved the value of string from rust from S to T. So that's, that's what variable bindings are. Next, let's look at data types. Now Rust is statically static. I always mess that up. Rust is statically typed language, which means that it must know the types of the variables at compile time. The compiler can usually infer what type we want uh, to use based on the value and how we use it. Like how we saw in X and Y, we didn't specify exactly what it is. Whereas for the string here, we specified that it's of type string, but Rust can actually make that uh, evaluation by itself. Now, the Rust primary types are divided into, let me just make sure I type it here. So data types, there's two different types. One is scalar types and the other one is compound types. Now, what are these? Let me type this out. So once in scalar types, we have integer types like uh, signed integers, which is I32, unsigned 32 integers. We have I64, which is 64 
uh, signed integer whereas unsigned 64 integer also there so these are some of the types the i i32 type is generally the default because it is fast on many cpus there's there's floating points also let's look at some examples of uh, so if i say let x if i want to specifically say what it is i specify here like this 42 so this is a signed 32 bit integer uh, which is also a default value uh, then we have floating point floating points are f32 and f64 the default type is f64 because it's roughly the same speed as f32 but it's capable of more precision so if i want to do that i say let y of the type f64 equal to 3.14 this is a float value here i can uh, and also there is a uh, boolean values where i can say let x equal to true or false so these are oh, sorry i think i should have used some x is true or false so these are the boolean values and then uh, we have uh, we have characters uh, characters are C H A R char uh, it represents represents a Unicode scalar value. So the way you define that is let C equal to char. Similarly here you can do bool, and for character you can specify C uh, or just any character here you can uh, specify. This is a Unicode character. So these are the scalar types that are available, which are uh, integers, floating point, booleans, and characters. Now, compound types, if you want to look at compound types, we have uh, two different types. One is tuples and the other one is arrays. Now, tuple is a general way of grouping together a number of values with a variety of types into one compound type. Uh, let's see what I'm talking about. So, if I create let t, now this tuple, which has multiple values, I can say it has i32, it can have f64, it has a character you can also put float if you want but I'm just gonna put these three now integers next is float so i'm gonna 6.2 something and then i'll give a character here i'll say x so this is a tuple another uh, example of a tuple let me just give me one more if you're looking at tuples first time this will probably help you more i32 i'm gonna say f64 and i'll have another unsigned integer say u8 now this is equal to i say 500 uh, 6.3 comma 1 something like that now want if you want to destructure a particular tuple like how do you use them uh, we also use destructuring where i can say that the first value i want to assign it uh, to y variable i can do y x y and z and then i can say tuple goes into xyz so what happens is the value of let's print it i can just say print ln and i can say the value of y is now you probably guessed it but let's see what does the compiler say if i run this so, oh i think i messed it up okay let's run again Two previous errors uh, add colon here so i'm missing semicolon here uh, could not compile due to one previous error which is unexpected let a boolean equal okay i forgot one here building now if you see the value of y is 6.3 right here so it takes the values so if x value is 500 y is 6.3 and z is one so that's what uh, uh, tuples and tuples look like now let's go over arrays now arrays unlike a tuple every element of an array must have the same type arrays in rust have a fixed length when you define it so you have to be careful what you set i'm going to say let a uh, it's an array of i32 it has all unsigned integers and how many do i have i have a length of five so i can give 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 comma 5 so now this is an array of length 5 uh, which has all signed integer 32 so i can also assign values i can say first equal to the way you access arrays is if you have done other programming language it's much similar at index 0 0 1 2 3 4 these are the indexes for this array i can say let second equal to 
say a of 1 now if I print it I can say the second element is and inside that I can say comma and give second run it and it will run the second element is 2 so that's how it works they don't get fooled by the indexes indexes start from 0 and that's why uh, it's it's this is the first element this is the second element third fourth fifth now next thing that we'll look at is control flow now let me get rid of these things control flow now with control flow uh, there is if loop uh, so let's go over if loop in rust if expressions allow you to branch your code depending on uh, conditions and if expression can uh, optionally be followed by an else block or a chain of else if conditions let's look at some examples so let's say if i say let number equal to 7 so i'm assigning a value of 7 and i am checking using if if number mod two so what is mod if you have never used mod before it gives you the remainder so 7 divide by 2 is 3 and then there's one remainder so that's the value you get one is what you get for if when you run this now is it equal to zero so that's what we can check so if it's zero which means if anything is divisible by 2 that means its number is even else i can say number is odd so in this case what do you think seven is even or odd just by looking at it you can probably tell that seven is odd and similarly if i give six it will say number is even so it divides by two and if the remainder is one which means it's not an even number uh, sorry odd num it's not an even number if it's anything other than zero if it's zero then it's an even number so let's look at an else if example i'm gonna say uh, let's keep remove this i can say if number oops, sorry, don't need brackets if number mod 4 in this case i'm going to use something different 4 equal to 0 then i'm going to say print ln and inside that i'm going to say number is divisible by 4 if it gives 0 because that means it's divisible by 4 else if i'm going to give else if and give one more condition number mod 3 equal to 0 in this case i'm going to say print ln is divisible by 3. Oops, i think i misspelled else i'm going to use the same thing copy this paste it here and say divisible by 2 divisible by 2. if none of these work i can also give a another one if none of them work i can say is not divisible by four three or two is not divisible by any of these numbers so in this case if the number is six you know it's not divisible by four because it's going to give you two as the output of this number is divided by three is three times two three times two is six so it will give you zero and it will run this it will not go to the next one because as soon as it meets a condition it will go there so if i run this particular example you'll see it's a number is divisible by three let's clear it now if i give a number two and run it it will say divisible by two because two divided by four is half so that's not possible three same thing two divided by two is zero so that will work similarly if i give eight in this case it will say divisible by four it will not go further if i give something like one which is not divisible by anyone it will say it's not divisible by four three or two I can give another example let's say let x is equal to let's pick a random number 42 now if x is less than 10 i'm gonna say easier to copy print ln uh, i'm gonna say the number is small uh, next i'll say else if x is less than 100 then i'm gonna say print ln 
number is medium and else if it doesn't work for any of them i can say print ln number is large there you go these are my conditions uh, for the first case if you look it will say medium because number is not less than 10 if i say 8 here you'll see it says small if the number is 120 which is bigger than 100 so it will go and run and say it's this large number so that's how uh, these if else conditions work now let's look at the next one which is loops so rust provides three kinds of loops to repeat code uh, i'm going to just instead of control flow i'll call it loops two three different types one is loop another one is while and then there is for so loop while and for so the difference between the three is uh, these can these three constructs can handle like repetitive task with uh, much ease instead of doing conditional uh, like if else uh, for loop the loop keyword tells rust to execute a block of code over and over again forever until you explicitly tell it to stop so if you want to run something constantly this is the way to go for example i'm going to create a mutated count and i'm going to assign it a value of zero since I want to loop it and change the value of count, that's why I set it as mutable uh, variable. Now, I'm, this is how you set up loop. You just say loop and inside that, whatever you add, it will constantly run. And I'm going to say count increment by one. So, so currently the value is zero, so it increments by one. So the value of count will be one at the first go around. So let's print that out and then just see if I'm not making that out okay. so if if i keep this like this it will constantly run and keep on printing one two three four five six seven eight for infinity so i want it to not go forever let's stop it after let's say five if count equal to five what i want to do is i want to break so this is how you can break out of a loop so let's run it and check if it works so see count equal to one, then it goes back again, increments by one, two, three, four, five. So that's how loops work. Next, let's look at the while. The while loop is similar to loop, but it includes a condition. The loop runs as long as the condition evaluates to true. So let's, let's keep that. Or actually, let's remove that. So I'm going to say let mutable number equal to three not double single equal to three and then i'll say while so the way you write while is you give the condition number is not equal to zero so say the value of number is three right now so it will run the while loop i'm going to say print ln count my display my number so this will display my number and then I want to in, uh, reduce by one. So it will go from three, uh, it will print three, and then reduce to two, go again, one. And then when it becomes zero, it will not execute anymore. So let's see, just to make sure that we come out of, come outside this, I can just say print ln and say we are out of loop. Or let's say while, just so we don't confuse ourselves. So let's run it. This is three, two, and one. And you print that out. And then when it's zero, it just gets out of the loop uh, because they will say while number is equal to zero, this doesn't execute. So we should get out and we are out of it. So that's how you create while loops. Next, for loops. Now the for loop is used to iterate over elements of uh, collections such as an array or a vector. We have not seen vectors, but we'll look at it in future. But it's we've seen arrays. So for loop is used to iterate over that. It's the most commonly used loop for iterating over a collection because it's safe and concise. So let's look at an example to understand how for loops work. So let's create an array first. Create an array, I'm not gonna assign it any types because it will automatically know that I'm using an uh, unsigned uh, integers with uh, inside here based on the numbers that I've set and now I'm going to say for element in a dot I'm going to say iterate through it so there's a function called as iter so it goes over 
each and every number at one time. So what it does is it goes to the first element 10 and assigns it to element. And so the element's value is 10 now. And here I can say print ln and I'll say the value is, give the value is the element. So you can see what I'm talking about. It keeps on going inside there and first it will assign the value 10. Next time when it comes, it will assign the value 20, 30, 40, 50. So let's run this and see the value is 10. Sorry, that's fine, but the value is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So there you go. That's how for loops work. Now, if you can also use for loops with range, uh, where, which is particularly useful for running a loop a certain number of times. So if you want to run a loop for a certain number of times, for example, I can say for i in 0 dot dot 5. So this means 0 to 5, not but not doesn't include 5. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I can say the print of value is keep the same code and run. So it's a value of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If you want to include 5 also, you can give 5 there. So what that does is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's how you can use uh, by a range. You can also do another thing. Uh, for example, for number in inside the bracket. Now, if I want to run it in a reverse order in this range, so I can say dot rev, that is a built in function again. So it runs from 4, 3, 2, 1, something like that. I can say, let me get rid of this for now, is number. I will run the code. And you'll see it goes, as I said, the last number is not conclude, included uh, unless I give equal to here, something like this, unless it will say three, two, one. I can run it again, four, three, two, one. This time I gave equal to, so that's why it's four, three, two, one. So that's uh, how for loops work. Now, conditional loops uh, with a break and continue is another thing that I want to look at. We saw the break option, uh, but let's look at uh, continue. Uh, you can use break to exit a loop immediately, which we saw before. Uh, and continue is used to skip the rest of the iteration and begin the next iteration. So you don't have to, with break, it completely comes out of the loop. Whereas if you use continue, it will, uh, it will just skip that particular iteration. So what do I mean? Let's write a function. So I'm gonna say one i in one dot dot, I wanna go from one to 10. So that's why I'm saying equal to. And inside here, I'm gonna say if number, mod, excuse mod that we learned. If it's an even number, I want to continue, which means I don't want to do anything. I want to skip this particular loop and go to the next number. So one, it will not go inside here because one mod two is not equal to zero. So it will say print ln. I can say the number that comes out is odd right, because it doesn't run for odd numbers. So it will go here, it will say one is odd, go second time, it, this time it's second, and it will continue So skip this and go back to for loop and go to the next number three, four, five. So this is, how. so in this example, continue is used to skip even numbers. So only odd numbers are printed. Let's look at this. Oh, print ln, I forgot this. Let's run it again. So one is odd, three, five, seven, nine. So it two, it skipped two, four, six, eight, and 10. So that's how you can use continue. So these are all the things that I wanted to do about loops. Uh, so next, let's look at pattern matching uh, with match. Pattern matching with match. Now this is a new thing. Uh, pattern matching in Rust is a powerful feature that allows you to compare a value against a series of patterns and execute code based on which pattern matches. Now the match construct in Rust is version is similar to switch statement if you use switch statement from any other languages but is significantly powerful due to its deep integration with rush pattern matching features uh, so let's look at the basic uh, match syntax the match expression takes a value and branches execution based on its value allowing uh, one of the several uh, code patterns to be executed so for example let's say i create a let coin uh, equal to Gonna, we're going to look over enums later, uh, but let's say coin is an enum representing different types of coins 
uh, that matches expression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say coin has penny. Uh, so this value of coin is a coin penny. Now let's create the enum name coin and I'm going to say there's different types of coins. One is penny type. The other type is nickel. Next type is dime and the last type is quarter. Now these are all American uh, coins. Penny is a cent nickel is five cents dime is 10 cents and quarter is 25 cents so i'm creating a coin object and i'm saying coin is of type penny now the way you use match is you first say match and then match the coin value to uh, what is it is it coin of the type penny if it is use the arrow and say print ln and we say lucky penny let's say that would be say next we give comma if it doesn't match like switch statement i'm going to use for all four of them and the let's say if it's nickel what to do if it's dime what to do quarter what to do let's see what should we write for nickel say it's a nickel i can't come up with anything crazy i'll say dime detect detected and for quarter I'm going to say quarter of a dollar. Okay, now this is how it will print out based on what it matches. Let's run this and see how this works. So if you see here, it says Lucky Penny. Uh, hello, Vivinarana and Lucky Penny. So it matched coin to penny because the value is penny and it's going to print out that particular value. Now if I change it to dime, it's a dime detector based on which statement. So you can kind of run a function or do whatever you want in here based on. We'll cover some more advanced match in future videos, but this will give you a basic idea of how match works. Next I want to look at is functions. What I'm going to do first is functions. Now fun fn is what you use. Functions are declared using that fn keyword. Uh, Rust code uses uh, uh, like snake case as conventional uh, style for functions and uh, variable names uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create another function outside what should i call it i'll call it another function very interesting and then i can give two parameters so this function takes two parameters uh, so i can say first parameter is i of the type uh, signed 32 integer and second one is y which is of the type float 64 this function takes two values i can say print ln exclamation the value of x is whatever value is passed from let's say main function i'm going to print it here same thing for y i'm going to do the same thing i'll say make it look pretty let me do it this way and now to call this function what you do is you just call the name and pass it values the first one is integer the second one is float so i'm going to give 6.3 something like that and then i run this and you'll see it's a value of x is 5 so it passes the value to this and uh, print that out when you call this function you need to provide the arguments in the same order as the parameter so you can't say 6.3 and 5 you give it in the same particular order uh, for functions so we'll look at more functions as in when we use it uh, but for now this is good next thing that i'm going to show is modules now modules is if your code is becoming too messy and everything you're till now we only used one file so what if i want to create another file and uh, write something inside that for example i want to create a function inside here i'm assigning pub which means public function which is available to outside I'm giving it two parameters x i what 32 so both integers and it gives back returns back this which is so what it does is it will take the value of the operation inside and return back that value so it takes two integers and returns back an integer so I'm going to save this as let's say math.rs and then I'm going to go back here first of all if you want to add that module into this particular function I'm going to go up there and I'm going to say I want to use that module 
called as math module. So what it does is this brings math.rs code into the scope of this. Now in here, I'm gonna say modules and inside here I can say for example print ln now I can say sum is since that is an add operation over there I am going to say use the math module and then inside that there is a public function add and I want to pass 3 and 4 to it so that's how you can incorporate a module inside your or your main function let's go run it and you'll see math so it, what it does is you don't need all these things I'm going to get rid of this so what it does is it will take uh, it will go inside here and it will say sum is the value of whatever is returned back from here now if you see the return back is an integer but it wants two integers so that's why I'm passing three and four here it will add those two numbers and return back three plus four seven to me so that kind of covers our uh, entire section of um, doing variables variable mutability variable binding data types functions control flow and modules so if you have any questions on this uh, hit me up with comments down there and uh, we'll cover more more sections in future thank you welcome back to react comprehensive crash course in this particular section we are going to look at structs now structs in rust are a way of grouping related data together into a meaningful package they are similar to structs in other languages like C if you've done before but with more powerful features such as methods and we're going to cover those too. Structs are used to create custom data types. Now defining and instantiating structs that's the first we'll look at. To define a struct you use the struct keyword followed by the name of the struct and the block containing all the fields for a particular struct. Let's look at a basic example. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside here and create you can probably create it outside I can say struct user this is how you can create a structure and for this user now if I want to give all the fields I'm going to say let's see user has a username which is of the type string next it has an email which is of the type string again we have let's say sign in count of how many times the user has signed in and I'm going to say that is unsigned 64 and is the user active for that I will use boolean if it's true or false so this is how you can create to use a struct after defining it uh, you create an instance of that struct by specifying concrete values for each uh, each of the fields so for example let's create an instance of this I can say let user let's give a variable instance variable user one and then I can say user and then I can pass it values like email is you give colon and then say it's a string so I'm going to say string from uh, someone at example.com let's give a random email next I want to give a username so I'm going to say username is again string from let's say someone uh, user so let's that's the username next I can say is the user active is true it doesn't matter the order in which you give it just matters the key value pairs and sign in count how many times has this user signed in one time that's how you can create a user uh, with values passed based on a struct defined that you've done now you can create mutable structs so this is by default as you know it's immutable now if you want to create a mutable struct what you have to do is you have to assign mute in front of it just like any other variable so now it's a mutable uh, mutable struct now uh, Rust does not allow marking only certain fields as mutable inside so everything the entire struct becomes mutable now I can change this by saying user1 dot email I want to change its email string from and I'm gonna say another at example.com so this way now I have initially assigned it someone at example but now I'm muting it mutating it to another at example.com so this is how you can create mutable structs 
Next thing is uh, field initialization shorthand uh, when variables and fields have some have the same name. So for example, if I have a function which uh, says that build underscore user and it's passing me email which is a string and username which is a string and this function returns back a user Oops. back a user so in this case uh, if i want to create a user object and if you see the email is same as this uh, so when the variables name from uh, which you're creating a struct instance and the struct field names are same you can use the shorthand initialization syntax for example i can say user I can say email i don't have to do anything else i just say email so it automatically assigns email to email username active now there's no value for active so i'm going to pass active is true and then i'll say sign in count equal to one so this is how you can uh, do a shorthand initialization next thing that i want to show is a uh, struct uh, update syntax you can create a new instance of a struct based on existing existing instance uh, with the struct update syntax which is dot dot so for example from this user one I want to create a user two and pretty much everything I want is same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say email string from, I'm going to say some uh, email at example.com. So this is the email that I'm giving, but I want the rest of the fields to be same. So I can just say user one. So what it will do is this syntax makes like user two have the same values for username, active, sign in count as user one, but it gives a new new email for this particular user. Uh, next thing we're going to look at is uh, tuple structs. Now we looked at tuples. So now tuple structs are similar to tuples, and they are useful when you want to give the whole tuple a name and add meaning to the elements. But you don't need to name each element individually. What do I mean by that? So for example. I can create struct, say color, and it has i32. i32, this is the tuple styles, i32. And I can sim create something similar for, let's say, a point in value i32, i32, i32. Now, when I create an object, I can say that black equal to, I can just say, use that struct color. And I can say 0, comma, 0, comma, 0. So this is how you can make like color hex, hex structs. And similarly for points, I'm going to say like point in screen, you can just assign this point and give it values over here and use that for as a user as a struct. Next thing that we can look at is uh, unit like structs. Unit like structs do not have any fields and are useful in situations where you need to implement a trait on some type but don't have any data to store in the type itself. Now we are not, not looked at traits uh, or uh, enums in particularly, but we'll probably look at them next. But for now, let's say always I create a struct called as always equal, and then I just want to assign it to something. So always equal. So in this case, you'll probably see like you do not have any fields and are useful in situations where you need to implement a trait on some. So that's that's how you do it. That's unit like structs. Now I mentioned about methods. Structs have methods in here. Now methods are functions that are defined within the context of a struct or an enum uh, or a trait object as I mentioned in enum and traits, we're gonna look at it later. But for now, uh, let's say in a struct and these are called on instances of that struct. Now let's say for this particular user, we have, this is the struct now, I want to implement user methods. So inside this, I'm gonna say, there's a function called as email and self. So this is how you pass the self object and it returns back string address by doing inside here, I'm gonna say dot self dot email. Uh, so this method takes an immutable reference to the self so it, this is how you pass the reference uh, to self in many programming languages you've probably also seen you don't pass the actual object but you pass the reference 
So you're passing the address where that object includes. Uh, and it returns back a reference to the email field. So it gives back a reference to the email field, which is of the type reference string. So that's what happens here. This is how you define methods. Now, there's also associated functions. Associated functions are functions that are associated with the struct, but don't take self as a parameter. So for example, I can say implement user and uh, inside that I can say function, let's say new, so associated. And inside that I have email passed as an object string. So these are often used as constructors. So if you're familiar with that, you'll probably understand what I'm doing. So it kind of creates something where you, it has some values in a particular order, you can call the function. So inside here, I'm gonna say for user, since the names are same, I'm gonna say email, username, active equal to true, and then sign in count equal to one, just with some values here because it just calls this thing. Now to call it, uh, what you can call this associated function using the colon colon uh, syntax. For example, I can say let user one equal to user and say new call that function inside that I can pass string from I pass x at email.com some random num name and then similarly for the next one which is the username uh, field I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to say a string from xyz that's the username so if in here you'll see like I used double colon to call this associated function and that's how this works. Now structs are a fundamental feature in Rust allowing you to structure related data together. By understanding how to define, instantiate and use structs along with their methods and associated functions, uh, associated functions you can create complex and meaningful types in your Rust programs. The use of uh, structs is crucial for creating well-organized modular and reusable code as you can see so if you want we'll probably work on it quite a lot when we build our own uh, exam examples and the projects you'll probably see that in those videos but this is how you create structs if you have any questions please leave them in the comments thank you hi welcome again uh, in this particular video we are going to look at enums and pattern matching now let's dive into enums enums also short for enumerations in rust allows you to define a type of type by enumerating its possible variants this feature is uh, particularly powerful in rust due to its strict type checking and pattern matching capabilities enabling safe and expressive handling of data that can vary in type let's look at how to define enums now to define an enum uh, use the enum keyword followed by the name of the enum and a block containing its variants. So what I mean by that, let's go over a simple example. I'll say enum, it automatically fills up everything. I'll probably not do that. What I'll do is I'll say enum not do that. Once you get used to this, you probably can automatically fill it up. So as I mentioned, you know, define enum, you use the enum keyword and then followed by the name. And in here, what are the different variants? So direction, I can just say, there is up direction, there is down direction, there is left, and what's the last one? Oh, right, yes. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you give all the variants here, you can keep on giving as many different you want. You can do north, east, north, south, whatever you want to give if you want to do more. Now, enums are useful for defining a type that can be one of the several variants. Each variant can optionally carry additional data than just this. So, for example, I can do an enum with data which is I'll say in a message and inside here I can have a normal quit message or I can have a move message asking a particular object to move to a new location which is let's say i32 let's keep it simple comma y i32 so this contains uh, data in here I can have let's say write a particular so you want to print something, you'll say write this particular string. So I can have a function here. You can also have a change color and then inside that pass the color parameters. 
can just say i32 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 uh, 8 gb values so if you want to add alpha 2 you can do that too now this enum has four variants with different types of associated data now how do you you like use let's look at how to use these enums now enums are used to create instances of their variants each variant can be treated as a function that constructs an instance of that enum so let's say if i want to say let message equal to now i want to use that message enum above and i'm going to say the value that i want to use is right and since it needs a string i'm going to say string from hello this is how you can use for if you're using direction you can just say up down it's pretty straightforward but this is how you can create an enum and pass a value it can be any of these variants that you can use but i'm using right and passing the string from hello uh, let's look at pattern matching because the pat the match operator the match control that we saw before uh, we learned a little bit about it you if you remember the coin uh, that we created for different types of coins and we matched it so the match control flow operator allows you to compare a value against a series of patterns and execute code based on which pattern matches that's what we saw with coin it's particularly useful with uh, enums because it enables enables you to unpack and handle each variant specifically uh, let's look at a basic match example with in a function so i'm going to just write something outside i'll say function let's say process the direction uh, and then it gets a parameter of oops i wanted to do that direction is of the type direction this is where i want to keep that now inside this function i can say match the direction now depending on what the user has passed here or whoever called this function is passed here if the direction is oh, this is frustrating something but i'm saying if the direction is up which is one of the value i will say print ln and inside that i'm going to say it's a going up same thing i can repeat this oops just comma 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 and comma so there's four different options that we have so if it's down left right you can just copy this here to left down so depending on if i call this function and say process and in the direction i say uh, direction up what it will do is it will uh, call this and print this particular going up and depending on which i pass it will do that uh, so this is how you can call a function now match with enum scaring data now let's see how can we process that so for example we have this enum with processing data so i'm going to say process underscore message uh, since it's message i'm going to say msg is equal to message so depending on whatever you're passing to this function i can say match and based on what the message is if the message is let's just make it easier squid then i can just say oops, print ln and inside that since it doesn't pass contain any data i just say quit if the message is move now move has two data elements i'll call it x and y that's what it is and if that is that i'm gonna say here move to x at a point and y at a point and in here i'll pass that x from a y that we get from here so this is how you can use this but again now if the message is the third type which is write a particular string for that i'll say let's say this text that comes out i can just say text where did i close everything properly here yes text message and inside here i can give that parameter that i need to pass which is text similarly the last one let's say message the last one is change color which has three parameters i'll say r 
j and b and then in here i can just say change oops change color to r is this one g is this one and b is this one and here i can pass r g and b values which we get from this particular place so this is how you can uh, match with enums carrying data now there's also an option t enum uh, rush does not have nulls but it has an enum that can encode the concept of a value being present or absent uh, with option t now the way that enum is defined is it's enum so let me just move stuff up so we have space here option t you put in the angular brackets and inside that i'll say sum t or none so these are two different values that is has so this is how you can have nulls in rust now this enum is so useful that it's included in the prelude you don't need to bring it into scope explicitly uh, you use option t whenever you have a value that might be missing uh, let's see how can we use this so for example i can say let some number is equal to sum of let's say five uh, sum t so it can have take any value inside it any parameter inside it i can say let some string equal to sum of let's say a string and i can say let absent underscore number which is option of i32 is none so in this case you'll probably see that i can assign some values of any type because option t can take any value type or i can also say that it's none uh, but it has option of i32 which which tells it that if there was a value it would be an i32 assi assigned uh, integer of type 32 also there's if let conveniences that is available for uh, situations where you are interested in only one variant of the enum uh, if let syntax offers a more concise way to handle values instead of match expression so this the way it works is you say if let and then say sum of 3 in this case sum underscore number is let's say print ln if it matches the sum let 3 is equal to sum number what it will do is it will say let's say print 3 or else it can print not 3 so in this case what do you think the answer is so the reason uh, it's, it's going to look at some 3 some number and some number is sum of 5 which doesn't match so it's going to say not 3 if you provide this value as 3 here it will match it and say oh this is 3 so let's print ln print 3 this code will print not 3 because some numbers value was here 5 initially that's what we had set now enums and pattern matching are among rush most distinctive features uh, providing powerful tools for handling data that can vary in type uh, by leveraging enums uh, you can express complex data structures in a type safe way reducing the possibility of errors now pattern matching uh, with match uh, and if let allows for clear concise handling of different cases making your code more uh, readable and express expressive in this case uh, together these features enable rush programmers to write like robust efficient and maintainable code so if you have any questions on these please let me know in the comments and i'll get back to you as soon as possible hello everybody and welcome back uh, to another rust session in this one we are going to talk about error handling now error handling is a crucial aspect of writing robust software now rust approaches error handling with the philosophy of making it explicit and manageable allowing you to write code that's resilient in the face of unexpected situations now rust groups errors into two major categories first one recoverable errors and second one is unrecoverable errors now just from name you can tell what they are let's look at recoverable errors uh, with the result enum 
so recoverable errors are situations in which it's uh, reasonable to report the error to the code that called your code and give that code a chance to retry the operation rust uses the result enum to handle these types of errors the result enum how does it look like so let me just show you the enum result t comma e and then if everything is all right it's gonna call okay and pass t if it's not all right it's gonna send an error so okay t an operation is success successful and the value t is returned and if the operation fails it gives e and the error is returned back so that's the result now let's see how we can use it so for using it first thing let's read do for some file read operation so i'm going to use the library standard library files and i'm going to call the file element in there so um, that's how you can do file operations now inside here i'm going to do first thing is let f equal to if you see i don't have any files other than the standard default code that we have been writing so i'm going to say open say hello dot text this is the name of the file now there's nothing hello dot text in my code here so what will happen if when it tries to open that file it probably should give me an error so what i'm going to say is if you're trying to match and everything is okay based on the enum that you saw so it will give me back the output properly and it will give me the file back no problem if it's successful if it's error what it will do is it will call the error function and pass me back the error over there i'm going to use panic which we'll look at a little bit later i just want the application to just crash say so problem opening the file and you can pass back the parameter of error there you go and it will give you a, a example of why the error happened so that's what happens here now if i want to call this i mean i'm already in the main so i don't have to do anything special go ahead and run this application and you'll see that it will see i have something not right here which line is this 16 i've opened match f okay file oh, i have to close this that's what it says here that just add there and you will see what it does there's it's a thread main panicked at this particular line problem opening file not found no such file or directory so what do i need to do to create that file so let me create that file i'll call it hello dot txt and save it in hello rust folder save and say hello world yes even though i'm not reading the file it's fine i'm gonna run this again and this time there's no error we just clear it so you can see it so no error it just says hello within a runner which means it was successful and the file is passed to this particular parameter now uh, this as you see this example tries to open a file and uses the match expression uh, to handle the result if the operation is successful it returns the file handle if it fails it panics and stops the program so that's what happens now how do you propagate error if this is this happens in a function and you want to send it to the main function uh, when you're writing a function that might fail instead of handling the error within the function uh, you can return the error to the calling code so that it can decide what to do with it instead of just crashing it here this is known as propagating an error so let's look at an example of propagating error i'm also going to use the io library say use std standard io and gonna access from there and read properties read properties. so that's what i access from there here i'm gonna get rid of this and let me write it in a special separate function i'm gonna say read let's say username from file that's the function that i want to call and what will it return it will return back to me a result right, which will have a string inside it and io error input output error in there uh, now 
let's do the same thing i'm trying to access that file which i've created now so let me say file dot file or open hello dot text now that file exists that is for sure we tested that out uh, next i'm going to say let mutable f because the value can change match f based on this f here let's do this and i'm going to say if for okay of file i'm going to return back file but if there is an error where let's say e i'm going to ba return back return error with e now this doesn't go outside the function it's just going to go assign it to this particular f here now i'm going to also create mutable s says string new i'm going to create a new string object it's mutable so that means i'm going to change based on what happens so i'm saying match f dot read to string now if i'm reading that particular file if i got that value i'm going to say uh, pass a reference variable using at the rate sign and i'm going to say this is what i want to the property inside there and if okay i don't want to create a variable so i'm going to just give underscore and i'm going to say everything is okay okay and pass back the s if not say error e and pass back error of e so this is what will propagate back and return back to the function that is calling so for example if this is the function that is calling let's create an object to take the return parameter now if you see the return will be same style say string comma io error so same as what is returned back here uh, i'm going to create this object and call this function read from file so this will assign back whatever comes back to this guy and it will ask it to decide decide what you want to do with this so i can say print just gonna print the value not do anything special with it say this let's put it inside comma and then check a dot is okay so if it's okay i'm sorry it's a built-in function where based on this a result i can check if is okay or is error so it's gonna print out true or false so let's run this and see if the value is propagated back clear it here I run it so it runs through that and it says true so everything is okay it was fine if that file didn't exist it's probably gonna say false and it would say that it's not okay so this is how you can propagate back error there's also a shortcut for propagating errors uh, using the question mark operator rush provides like this convenient way to propagate errors up the call stack using the question mark operator which automatically does the match operation seen in the previous example let's look at an example of how to use the question mark error i'm going to keep everything same here uh, even the function will be same in here instead of this what i'm going to do is i'm going to try to use this as much as possible let f uh, i'm going to say mutable f file open and if it can't open question mark what i'm going to give here i'm going to use the let mutable s equal to string do the same thing that i did before so creating this mutable s string here i could have just copied it and then i can say f dot read to string pass the same stuff here and mute x question mark and then i will say okay s so if everything goes back this is what is going to be returned so this is how you can use shorthand in using the question mark operator and you don't have to use the checking matching parameter here uh, to do uh, checks if uh, there's an issue it will call back propagate the error back now there's also unrecoverable errors with which you can 
take care with panic now unrecoverable errors are serious errors that indicate your program is in a state it cannot handle uh, you'll usually terminate your program when an unrecoverable error occurs so rust has the panic which we used before uh, panic macro for these situations uh, let's look at panic let's as soon as i print here i can say panic and say crash and burn if i run this application you'll see it says crash and burn right away and it crashes the particular application saying that that's it nothing else i mean anything after this code is unreachable because of course this is a panic and when a panic occurs the program prints an error message winds and cleans up the stack and then quits that's what happens so rust error handling features help us help you write better more resilient code uh, the result enum allows handling recoverable errors elegantly giving you control over how to respond to errors the question mark operator which we saw simplifies propagating errors up the call stack for unrecoverable errors uh, rust provides the panic macro to stop execution and start the process of terminating the program that's what we went through this by understanding and efficiently using these tools that we learned uh, in this particular video you can handle errors in rust confidently and write robust reliable applications uh, that crash and sometimes don't crash so best of luck if you have any questions let me know in the comments and i'll try to answer them as soon as possible welcome back to another video on rust and in this particular topic we are going to talk about ownership ownership is one of the key feature of rust that ensures memory safety and concurrency without needing a garbage collector it's based on a set of rules that the rust compiler checks at compile time so no runtime overhead is involved understanding ownership is crucial for writing efficient and safe rust programs so let's go over first the rules of ownership ownership in rust is governed by three main rules as you see on the screen first one is each value in rust has a variable that's called its owner there can be only one owner at a time and third one is when the owner goes out of scope the value will be dropped these rules ensure that rust programs are free from dangling pointers double frees and many other bugs related to memory management if you have used any other type of programming languages you're probably familiar with that if not probably go over them in a little while so let's look at variable scope and ownership a variable scope starts when it is declared and continues until it goes out of scope when a variable goes out of scope rust automatically calls a drop function and cleans up the heap memory associated with that variable if any so let's say in this particular function or i'll create a new function i'll call it function test and inside this create a variable s and this i say string from hello so that so in this particular case as soon as we declare the variable s s is valid from point from this point onwards i can do whatever i want uh with s here and that will still be in scope because as soon as as, as long as this is inside the brackets it's fine but as soon as you go outside and try to do something here uh, with the variable s this scope is now over here and s is no longer valid so that's how scope works it's based on where is declared and until where it is available um next let's talk about uh, look at the string type so consider the string type uh, which is allocated on the heap and can store an amount of text that is unknown at compile time so you have a mutable string and you don't know how much memory it will take it demonstrate ownership features well because it manages resources and memory so for example if i do let s or get rid of this just so there's no confusion so let's say mutable s because i want to change this afterwards so in this case i have hello in here now i want to change let's say push string i want to push more value into it hello up oh, sorry hello is already there so i'm going to say world in this case what happens is push string appends a literal to the existing string and if you print this out probably see in this case so it's going to say hello world 
so in this particular case this will print hello world uh, now the ownership of s is kind of demonstrated here where it retains the value and heap and it just in it it kind of doesn't know the value or how much memory it needs during compile time in this case uh, let's look at move in rust assignment or uh, function arguments passing uh, fu or function argument passing can transfer ownership of a value this is known as move uh, something that we have looked at before where if i have let's say a variable s1 string from hello and if i say let s2 equal to s1 what i'm doing here is i am moving the value of s1 to s2 so what will happen if i say print me the value of s1 in this case so it gives me an error because it says value borrowed here after move so value is gone it doesn't have the value so but if i print s2 it works the reason is because once you assign some value to other it moves the value says so nothing available at that particular place and it's kind of invalid so when you assign s1 to s2 the, da the data pointer length and capacity are copied not just the data itself so s1 is no longer valid after the move preventing uh, double free errors in this case now this an option if you looked at this it says that why don't you use clone so if you want if you do want to deeply copy the heap data of the string not just the stack data we can use the method called clone so in that case instead of doing this i can say and this dot dot clone so it will deep copy this value so if i go back run it s2 will has this value if i go s1 s1 will have its value so both of them have that value there's also copy trait which we have looked at before now rust has this special annotation called the copy trait that we can place on types like integers that are stored on the stack so as you saw before integers floats booleans and uh, characters they are all stored on the stack uh, and not on the heap so if if a type implements the copy trait variables that use it do not move but rather are trivially copied making them still valid after the assignment so for example if i say let x equal to 5 and then i say let y equal to x since these are integer types when you say print ln x it's going to print 5 for x even if i do print for y it will print 5 so both will have because they are deeply copied or not deeply copied they are on the stack so they are just copied values directly there's no pointers in there um, now how about ownership and function so passing a variable to a function will either move or copy just as assignment does returning values can also transfer ownership let's look at some examples so let me get rid of this say let s equal to string from hello so in this case s comes into scope next i'll say takes ownership function and to this i'm passing s so what happens is s this value here moves into a function and so no longer valid after that so now i say let y or uh, let's say it's x equal to 5 now x comes into scope and i say call a function called as make copy and pass the value of x in this case x would would move into the function but i30 since is i32 is copy so it's okay to still use x afterwards here x is still valid here but s is not valid because x s is of the type string and they are they are on the heap and not on the stack so if you look at the takes ownership function if i write that implement that function say so some string string so in this case what happens is some string comes into scope because it's part of the argument and if i print here some string goes out of uh, scope after this closing bracket and is dropped uh, because it will free out the memory 
Uh, similarly, if I call a mix copy function and pass some integer integer in here, so of the type i32, which I've already passed x here. So in this case, what will happen is let me just go ahead, println comma some integer. So in this case, some integer comes into scope. Uh, at the end of it, some integer goes out of scope, but nothing happens because it's part of the part of the stack. Now, uh, understanding ownership along with some related concepts of borrowing, which we'll do in the next uh, video and lifetime, which we'll do a video later, is fundamental to mastering Rust. Now, ownership ensures memory safety and prevents data races, making Rust program reliable and efficient. So if you have any questions, just leave it in the comment and we can go over that. Thank you. Welcome to another video. In this particular video, we are going to talk about references and borrowing in Rust. Now, references and borrowing are integral concepts in Rust that work alongside with ownership, which we did in the last video, to ensure memory safety without the overhead of a garbage collector. Now, references allows you to refer to some value without taking ownership of it, which is especially useful for accessing data while still allowing the owner to remain the owner and eventually clean up the data. So let's look at references. Like a reference is created using the AND symbol. You've probably seen that uh, we've used it before. And it allows you to refer to the value of the variable without taking ownership. When the reference goes out of scope, it does not drop the value it points to uh, because it does not own it. It's more like, you know, you give someone your address, but not your house. So you give an address to your house so they can use it, but they can't actually release it. It's under your ownership. So let's look at creating on uh, creating references. So we'll go over here. Say, let's say S1 equal to string from, let's say, same stuff. Hello. And now let's calculate the length of this particular string. I'm going to just call a function, call it calculate length. And to this, instead of passing the actual string because it will lose ownership, I'm going to just pass the reference to it. That's how you do it. And then I can say println. And inside this, I can say the length of let's say whatever the string was is whatever the value is and here i'm going to say s1 comma the length and now let's go ahead and write that function calculate length which takes s as an argument but it doesn't have the actual string it has the reference to the string and it will give me back a use size which is the size length of the string in this case and i'm going to say s dot length that's all i need to say let's run this and you see the length of hello is five so what happens in here is we just pass the string address it looks at the string gets it length and then gives it back but it doesn't have the ownership of it so in this example s is the reference to s1 the function calculate length can use s to perform operations on S1, but it does not own it. After the function call, S1 is still valid because a scope is inside here. Now let's look at, uh, next look at mutable references. Now mutable references allow you to change the value you are referencing. However, Rust enforces a rule that you can have either one mutable reference or any number of immutable references to a particular piece of data in, in a particular scope but not both. This rule prevents data races at compile time. Let's think about it. You are constantly changing the value in different places and it's referenced by different places. So it could, that's what is called a data race uh, during compile time. So let's look at creating a mutable reference. So in this case, whatever we have above here, let's use that. I'm gonna say mutable S, let's call it S string from hello let's keep it that way and here call a function change and this function i will pass usually you'll pass 
the string value like this but in this case since I'm passing mutable you say mute in front of it and now in your function change some string that is passed I'm gonna say mutable string here and inside my function I'm gonna say some string dot push underscore string you've used this before push this wrld world and so in this case what happens is it passes that and it we change that uh, strings value from hello to hello comma world and you're passing a mutable instance of this now the rules of references uh, at any uh, the two of them at a give any given time you can have either one mutable reference or any number of immutable references to a piece of data but not both now references must always be valid rust will not allow references to dangle so it will just give you an error and we'll look at one example about dangling references like rust compiler ensures that references do not outlive the data they refer to preventing dangling references so let's look at an example i can say function dangle now in this particular function i am returning back string so dangle returns back a string here i'm going to go let s equal to string from and pass it hello now s is a new string in this case and it's it's, uh, its scope is only this function and i want to return that back to that so what i'm doing is i'm not passing the string i'm passing a reference to the string and what uh, what this uh, our rust will do is it will give you an error saying that you can't pass a reference that will dangle your string so hence s goes out of scope and is dropped its memory goes away and the above code will not compile in rust because it tries to return a reference to a variable s that goes out of scope at the end of the dangle function this next thing that i want to cover about is slices slices let you reference a contiguous sequence of elements in a collection rather than the whole collection so you can get a con continuous sequence of elements instead of the entire collection a slice is a kind of reference so it does not have ownership let's look at what slices look like so i'm going to go here and get rid of these things i say let s equal to string from hello world now in this case if i just want hello inside a hello string and i just want the reference to it so i can say s but i don't want everything i want 0 to 0 1 2 3 4 5 so i just want hello so that's what i'll do now if i want world in a different variable i can say 6 to 11 and that will have word in there slices can also be applied to arrays so for example if i have an array of one two three four five and if i just want to get a slice of this array i can say refer this array and i just want one two three something like that. this code creates a slice that includes elements at indexes one and two but not three because if you want three then you'll probably have to do this but this will just have one and two inside it so you'll have two and three in this case because the indexes of two and three is one and two it's a little confusing because of the way it's written but that's how the slices work now references and, and borrowing whatever we learned here allows the rush programs to efficiently access data without taking ownership and without the risk of null pointers or dangling references by enforcing rules around mutability and borrowing rust ensures safety and concurrency making the code more reliable now understanding these concepts is crucial for working effectively with rust's ownership system and we'll see a lot of these in our examples uh, to follow but if you have any questions do let me know in my comments and uh, i'll get back to you as soon as possible hello and welcome back to rust comprehensive crash course in this particular video we are going to look at uh, lifetimes and lifetime annotations 
uh, so lifetime in Rust are a compile time feature used to ensure that references are valid for as long as they are needed. Uh, lifetime prevent dangling references by ensuring that references do not outlive the data they point to. Uh, lifetime annotations don't change how long any of the references live. Instead, they describe the relationship between the lifetimes of multiple references. Now, to understand lifetimes, uh, every reference in Rust has a lifetime, which is the scope for which that reference is valid. Most of the time, lifetimes are implicit and inferred, just like most of the time, types are inferred. However, similar to type annotations, you sometimes need to declare lifetimes explicitly to help the compiler understand the relationship between the lifetimes of references. Now, syntax of lifetime annotations, uh, lifetime annotations are denoted with an apostrophe followed by some descriptive name, usually short like apostrophe A, apostrophe B. We'll see some examples about that. But the lifetime name uh, apostrophe static is a special lifetime that means the reference data can live for the entire duration of the program. Let's look at some examples here. Now, you know, when I do and I32, this is a reference to a particular integer, unsigned, assigned integer. 32. Now, if I want to do a reference with the explicit lifetime, I will say apostrophe A and I 32. This is how you create a explicit lifetime reference. Now, next, if you want to do a mutable reference with an explicit lifetime, you do the same thing where you say mute I 32. So these are the three different types of uh, different ways you can do this. Now, function signatures with lifetimes, how we, we do that? When defining functions that take references as parameters, you might need to specify lifetimes on the function uh, signature to ensure the references passed into the function are valid. For example, so if I create a function longest, I will create a lifetime for that and then x one of the argument, I'm going to give it a reference, a string, and y is also, copy this over, and this returns the same reference to a lifetime string. Now, inside this, I'll say if x dot length is greater than y dot length in this case return x else return y so in this example uh, the function longest takes two string references and returns a string reference uh, the lifetime annotation indicates that the return types lifetime is related to the lifetime of the parameters x and why? That's why we have the same uh, same annotation. Now let's look at how structs work with lifetimes. When you are storing references in a struct, Rust needs to know the lifetimes of those references to ensure the data referenced by the struct is valid as long as the struct is. So, for example, if I create a struct important excerpt. I give a lifetime and inside this I'm making an item for part and this one let's say string. So now in this particular case this struct has one field part that holds a string slice uh, which is reference which is a reference to part of the string. Now the lifetime ensures uh, that important excerpt cannot outlive the string it references. Now there's some lifetime Ellison rules. Um, Rust applies three rules to infer lifetimes when you don't explicitly annotate them, allowing you to omit lifetimes in common scenarios. Uh, these rules apply to functions or methods. Now if the compiler can apply these rules to determine 
unambiguous lifetimes, it doesn't need explicit annotations. So each parameter that is a reference gets its own lifetime parameter. Next, if there is exactly one input lifetime parameter, that lifetime is assigned to all output lifetime parameters. And if there are multiple input lifetime parameters, but one of them is reference to self or reference to mutable self for methods, the lifetime of self is assigned to all the output lifetime parameters. These rules cover a significant number of cases and help keep function signatures concise and, and readable. Now let's look at lifetime annotations in method definitions. So when defining methods on structs with lifetimes, you need to annotate the lifetime similarly to functions. So for example, have implementation is let's say important was not index it and say a inside that I have a function which has a reference to self I forty two so it comes back let's say three function and nouns and return part pass it a reference to self and announcement of reference to self and this returns back a reference to string oops i think this is meant to string yes and then inside i'll say print ln and say attention please give it a value of the announcement and return here self dot part so if you see how the how the lifetime annotation in method definitions work next thing that we'll look at is static lifetime now as i mentioned the static lifetime uh, is the longest possible lifetime and it lasts for the entire duration of the program all string literals have the static lifetime uh, example how you can explicitly set it is you can say reference to static string equal to i have a static lifetime so lifetimes are so this is how you can define a static lifetime to a string which has which will live for the entire duration of the program now in conclusion lifetimes are a fundamental part of rush approach to memory safety they allow the compiler to ensure that references do not uh, do not outlive the data they point to uh, by using lifetime annotations you help the compiler understand how lifetimes lifetimes of different references relate to each other ensuring that your rush programs are both safe and efficient while the compiler can infer lifetimes in many cases thanks to the lifetime elision rules understanding how to manually annotate lifetimes is crucial for working with complex scenarios uh, where the compiler needs your guidance uh, so if you have any questions on this please uh, leave comments and i'll get back to you as soon as possible thank you Welcome back and today we are going to look at Rust collection. Now Rust provides several collections in the standard library for storing a variable number of values. Collections are more flexible than arrays or tuples because their size can change if their contents are stored on the heap. The, the most commonly used uh, collections are these three vector uh, which is also represented by vector t allows you to store a variable number of values next to each other. Next is string. A string is a collection of characters. It's growable, mutable, owned, and UTF-8 encoded string type. Uh, next is the hash map. Uh, hash map has KV, which is also 
कि एक की वैल्यू अलाउस यू टू मैप कीज ऑफ द टाइप के टू द वैल्यूज ऑफ द टाइप बी इट इम्प्लीमेंट्स द एसोशिएट्स एसोशिएटिव अरे डेटा स्ट्रक्चर सो लेट्स लुक एट वेक्टर्स इन मोर डिटेल नाउ वेक्टर्स अलाउ यू टू स्टोर मोर देन वन वैल्यू इन अ सिंगल डेटा इन अ सिंगल डेटा स्ट्रक्चर एंड ऑल वैल्यूज मस्ट बी ऑफ द सेम टाइप वेक्टर्स आर इम्प्लीमेंटेड यूजिंग जेनरिक्स दैट्स वाई वैक्टर इन एंगुलर ब्रैकेट इन सी टी कैन होल्ड एनी टाइप नो लेट्स लुक एट हाउ टू क्रिएट अ वैक्टर नाउ इफ आई वॉन्ट टू क्रिएट अ वैक्टर से लेट पी एंड देन ऑफ द टाइप वैक्टर एंड इन साइड दैट आई वॉन्ट द डेटा टाइप ऑफ आई थर्टी टू इक्वल टू वैक्टर न्यू दिस इज हाउ यू कैन इनिशिएट अ न्यू वैक्टर नाउ How do I use this vector? So let's look at that and say let v equal to vec one, two, and three. So this is how you can use. Uh, how do you update a vector? To so update a vector, let's say I have a mutable vector vec new. and now inside this i want to push some values so i can just say push and let's say 5 can similarly write a bunch of times as many times you want 6 7 8 this is how you can uh, push values or update a particular vector now how do you if you want to read elements from a vector and print them out let's say let's third Thirty two equal to, and I'm gonna give the value of vector two. So I'm gonna just go ahead and comment these out for now, and then in here I'm gonna say print ln the third element. Is third. So in this case, what will happen is let's go ahead and run this. So you'll see the third element. Okay, spelling mistake there. Third element is seven. The why is it saying seven? This is the first, second, and this is the third element because we created a new vector and we pushed in there. If you push numbers just to make sure that gives you. Values properly. Here it is. So that's how you can use it. You can also use the match. I can say match v dot get two. Now I'm gonna say sum if it matches. I'll say print ln the third element is. Third, if it doesn't match, let's say use the none. Current Ellen, there is no third element. So I'm asking, get me the third element, and let's run this. So when I say third element is three, so what it does is it tries to get the third element zero, one, two, and If this does exist, it's going to say that. If it doesn't exist, it will give an error. So if I go again, it will say. If you check this out, it says index out of bounds. It gives me the error, saying that there is no third element in there. Uh, so that's with vectors. Now let's look at strings. Now strings are a collection of characters. Uh, Rust has only one string type in the core language, which is str, the string slice type. Uh, the string type which is provided by rust standard library is a growable mutable owned utf8 encoding type string which we saw before now let's go ahead and see how we can create a new string you know comment this vector code out or get rid of that and if i want to create let's say mutable string you can see probably i've seen this before in some of our examples but this is how you can create a new string now to update a particular string i can say let's say if i have this string that i've created uh with some let's say call it mute 
two dot two string. So I'm saying that take this set of characters and convert that into string. And then I'm going to say s dot push underscore string bar. So now this will take this string and then add bar to it. Now also there's concatenation. Now you can use do concatenation uh, with plus as many other languages, or you can use the format macro. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that create one s1 equal to string from hello. So I'm creating a string here and then I create s2 you know what's going to go inside that so I'll just go ahead and copy this and I'm going to say world so I have the hello string and the world string and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another string say s3 and inside that I'm going to say use s1 and s2 concatenate now instead of doing this you can also do this here what I'm doing is s1 has been moved here and cannot be used anymore. But S2, you're just passing the address location of that so it knows what the value is. So that's just another way of doing it. Another option is I can say S, let's say four, using the format I mentioned. So format macro, and inside this, I can say this, space, this, and I want to have S2 and s3 in this the reason i'm using h2 and s3 is because s1 doesn't exist anymore so it will concatenate these two strings now s2 is world and s3 is hello world so it's going to display that uh, inside s4 or save that inside s4 next one that we want to look at is hash map now hash map has key value pairs uh, also in some uh, languages you know it as dictionary so hash map allows you to associate a value of some type of uh, v with a key of some type k so what does that mean let's go ahead and create uh, let's for this first of all i'll need the library so i'm going to say use from the standard library of i think it's collections and i want to use hash map from there now to create one let's see let mute Let's use course for this one and I'm going to say hash map new. This is how you can initialize a hash map. Uh, now, if I want to insert something inside this hash map, I can say scores dot insert and I can say I want to insert string from. So this is the key that I'm assigning it saying, let's say blue team has scored 10 points so key value this is how you can assign key values inside hash map same thing you can do that again insert from let's say yellow team i'll give it 50 points uh, now if you want to access the values of this what you can do is you can just say let's say team name string from blue i'm creating a string here with the team name and it's score equal to scores dot get and i'm going to pass the pointer to it let's say team name to whatever i created so what it this will do is it will give me the score from inside here which matches with this particular value so if blue since i'm passing blue it's going to give me in here so and that's how hash map works now if you want to update a particular hash map is more like overwriting a particular value uh, you can do that you can only insert if the key has no value you can also do updating a value based on the old value what i mean by these is for example let's say if i want to overwrite a value so i can say scores dot insert string uh, let's copy this here say i want to change this to 25 so what this does is this overrides the previous value which was 10 now it's going to put 25 inside this now similarly if you don't want to do anything if the key exists 
already there is a value and you don't want to do anything i can do uh, i can say is score dot entry is the function that i use and i can let's update this one so if i want to update yellow in this case uh, or insert so what i'm doing is if this value exists then don't do anything or if it doesn't exist then go ahead and insert 50 inside it so that's how entry works so if it checks if the entry exists if it doesn't exist it will insert it will create this entry and insert 50. next thing is uh, updating a value based on the old value so i can just say less text equal to hello world wonderful world something like that i have a string here and now i'm creating a table hash map how do i create it hash map new and next i want to go through write a for loop to check from the text i split it uh, where as uh, with the white space in there so it's going to split into hello world wonderful and world so white space is the function so what it does is it gives me first hello puts it in word and then runs this for loop and inside this for loop it will check let count equal to map dot entry word so i'm checking if this word exists if it doesn't what i'm going to do is i'm going to insert the value zero and then i will say count plus equal to one so i'm implementing the value of count and it goes to the next one and then keeps on doing this so this is how you can update a value based on an old value now rust collections all the things that we learned here are powerful tools for storing and managing data in your programs vectors allow for storing list of values strings handle collections of characters and hash map associate keys with values now understanding and using this collection effectively will enable you to handle various data storage and manipulation uh, task in Rust. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. Welcome back uh, to another video. And this video, we are going to talk about uh, current concurrency in Rust. Now concurrency in Rust allows multiple tasks to run simultaneously, leveraging the power of the modern multi-core processes efficiently and safely. So Rust ownership types and borrowing rules lend themselves well to writing safe concurrent code preventing data races and ensuring thread safety without needing a garbage collector. That's what we saw before. Now, some of the key concepts in Rust concurrency includes threads. The most fundamental unit of concurrency, Rust provides a way to run code on different threads. There's also message passing, uh, where concurrency often involves multiple threads or actors communicating with each other. Now, Rust encourages a message passing concurrency model using such channels, and we'll see that in a little while. Also the shared state, Rust also supports shared state concurrency, but it enforces strict rules to ensure the safety. Uh, last is the sync and send trades. These marker trades allow Rust to ensure that your types are safe to use in concurrent contexts. Now let's look at how to use, um, use threads. Uh, for, so first, creating the threads. So you can use the thread colon colon span function to create a new thread and run code in it and uh, this requires passing a closure of closure to thread spawn uh, that contains the code you want to run in the new thread let's look at an example here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to first use the import make sure that thread is in the context and then another module that i need is the time module so i can put it to sleep for a little while So I need these two modules. Once I have that, next I'll probably inside here. Let's say let me get rid of everything. I need thing in here. Make sure this is okay. So then I'm gonna say thread spawn. This is what I was talking about. So I create a thread spawn, and inside that I'll give a condition and say here for I in a range of one to let's say 10, so it's actually one to nine, print 
ln and inside this i'm going to say let's say hi number what is the number that i'm know from the bond thread and inside here i'm going to pass the i number that we have here and then once this is done i'm going to make it sleep for a smaller duration so i'm going to just say duration from i l l i s millis so milliseconds of one that's what i'm going to do uh, i am going to do one more outside this outside the thread in this case i'm going to say for i in so this is outside so this will not have any problem with the other i because the scope is different print ln hi number from the so whatever i do here is the main thread so i'll say from the main threads and whereas whatever I, since i'm creating a separate thread here and running this it's it's a separate thread that's running concurrently so i'm going to say i here and i'm going to do the same thing here so this what it does is just puts the main thread to sleep in this case and it will sleep for a second i'll run this application so you'll see so hi one from main thread spawn thread main thread spawn thread so it's running simultaneously at the same time if you see in this case it ran up till five uh, because the main thread is done after this so that's why nothing happens since the main thread is over the function is over so there's not, not this thread even though it's running in the background will be killed after that so you have to be careful when you spawn threads and if your main thread is not running then the side threads will not run it will close the application now waiting for threads to finish you can use the join method on the handle returned by thread spawn to wait for the thread to finish that's another way of doing it where you can just say so for example i can go here and i can say let handle equal to and make sure it runs to do is join dot unwrap so this is what will make sure that the thread returned will probably complete and you'll have to will wait for it to to run let's look at an example of that so if you see in this case it waits for it to completely finish and then it runs this code after that uh, next thing that we want to look at is message passing uh, which is our standard library provides an implementation of channels for message passing that's what i said like you know we'll use channels now channels allow you to send messages between threads so let's get rid of this and uh, we what we need is so we want multiple producer and single consumer plus so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say use std standard sync multiple producer single consumer that's the library that we want that's the module that we want this i don't need uh, the time one anymore inside my function i'm going to say let tx comma rx transmitter and receiver mpsc create a new channel so this is how you can create a channel once you create this channel you can create spawn a thread how do you spawn a thread spawn a thread i can say move or run this and inside this i'm going to say let message equal to string so the message that i want to send so i want to send a message hi and i say transmitter dot send msg and unwrap that so that's my transmitter sending the message now let's see if the receiver which is the main thread received the message seed equal to rx dot receive and let's say unwrap i think i forgot the dot and then i can go ahead and say print ln okay, I got that. what did i receive let's see got 
comma receipt. So I'm printing that out. So let's look, let's check how this message passing is working. And if you see here, it's saying could not compile hero rush due to one previous error. Let's clear this and uh, okay, so I forgot. Uh, so I have my, in case of it, I forget the, let's see, okay, here. And there you go, got high. So it sends high, and this this uh, thread that was spawned, it uh, sends high, and it's received by. So you can send messages between threads. So if you want to a particular thread to do something, and then once it's done, send a message to the main thread. You can have the, this channel created and uh, send these messages. Next is the shared state concurrency. Now Rust ensures safe shared state concurrency using its ownership and type system. Uh, the mutex and arc types are particularly useful. Now let's see how to use the mutex. A mutex allows only one thread to access some data at a given time. So I have my saying what I need is I need mutex and I'll also use arc right now. And my thread, get rid of this here. Let's create a counter in the start. I'm going to initiate a new arc and inside that I use mutex new at zero. So that's how you can create an arc with an element mutex inside this. I'm going to create a mutable handle with vectors inside this you remember we can create vectors using this uh, macro now for underscore which means i don't want to create a parameter or a, uh, sorry a variable in this case so i can just give underscore and i can say let counter equal to arc clone and pass the address of the counter to it and i can say handle equal to thread spawn move something we saw before we create a spawn thread and inside this thread i'm going to create a mutable number which is my counter dot i'm going to lock that so nobody else can use it unwrap it and then increment the number by one. Now, once I do that, okay, don't, do not forget the semicolons, handles dot push this handle into this. So whatever I created, push that handle. And so, so keeps on adding it inside the handles and I have nine or 10 can zero to nine handles inside there. Now, to make sure that they run, what I'm going to do is handle in handles. If you remember this, we did make sure that they all run. Join is what we use. And of course, unwrap. Now we can print this by saying result is counter dot lock so i lock that value and i'm gonna say unwrap standards and now if i run this particular application so the problem here i see what the problem is i missed a semicolon here so i'm gonna go ahead and run this again and if you see the result is 10 because it probably made sure that it got the counter incremented and every time it increments i have the last number which is 10 which is the result out here so uh, next is sync and send traits. Now the compiler automatically adds the send trait to types that are safe to send to another thread and sync traits to types that are safe to be referred from multiple threads. Now in this case send, it indicates that ownership of the type implementing send can be transferred between threads. Whereas sync indicates that it is safe for the type implementing sync to be referenced from multiple threads. Now from what this particular video, what we've learned is, learned is Rush concurrency model emphasizes safety and data race prevention. It uh, provides powerful primitive 
like threads, message passing through channels, and shared state concurrency with Mutex and Arc, all while leveraging its ownership and type system to compile time uh, to compile time checks for thread safety. Now, this approach allows you to write efficient concurrent code with confidence, reducing the risk of common concurrency pitfalls which you face in other programming languages. So that's how uh, threads or concurrency works in uh, Rust. So if you have any questions, please leave a comment and I'll get back to you. Welcome to a video on advanced traits and types in Rust. So now Rust type system and trait system offers powerful tools to define common interfaces for multiple types and to extend the functionality of existing types. Now this video delves into more advanced aspects of traits and types including the associated type, default type parameters, specialization and some more we'll cover. So let's look at, let's jump directly into the first one which is associated types. Now associated types connect uh, a type placeholder with a trait such that the trait method definitions can use these placeholder types in their signatures. There are, there, they are a way of defining a trait that uses uh, one or more types without specifying what those types are until the trait is implemented. Now let's look at the iterator trait. Uh, if I want to, let's say, the way I do it is, I'll say, pub trait iterator and it's of, I have type item inside it and function next. So since I want to iterate through, I'm going to create this next function and inside that I'll pass the mutable copy of self and I say option with self item. So this is how you can iterate over items using the iterated trait. Now in this example, item is a, an associated type uh, for associated type of the iterated trait. Now implementers of this trait will specify what type item is for their particular situation. Now let's look at the default generic type parameters and operator overloading. Now Rust allows you to define default types for generic type parameters in traits. This feature can be combined with operator overloading to extend the functionality of Rust operators to work with your custom types. Now, example of operator overloading with the with the add trait is here. Yeah, let's go for it. I'm gonna say standard operator. I think I forgot yeah, this one. And I'll say add is what I want. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and let's go inside the Let's go here and I'm going to create a struct and inside I call it the name is point x is I have two parameters inside i32 and y of i32 so I have two parameters for this struct looks good here next I'm going to implement the add Trait. Say add for point. I'm gonna say type output equal to point. Then I'm gonna add a function inside here. Say add pass argument self and other which is a point, and this returns back a point to me. And that point will be having x self dot x the other plus other dot x comma. Same thing for y. I'm gonna say y is self dot y and whatever the y of this other is. There you go. So that's probably the thing. And now inside here, let me get rid of this assert equal to let's check it out I'll say point x which is 1 and y which is 0 plus point x which is 2 y which is let's say 3 comma is this if I add this up will this give me point 
x so i look at it 1 plus 2 3 comma 3 plus 0 3 so that's that's how we can specify an operator overloading with add trait let's run it and we have an error of course oh yeah i have to specify use this as partial equation so run it and there you go it said everything is fine it didn't give any error or else it would have given an error if this was not matching so that's how this works now let's next look at specialization now specialization is a feature that allows for more specific train implementation to override more general ones uh, as of my knowledge full specialization is not yet stabilized in rust but it's a feature that has been desired for allowing more flexible trait implementations now next we can look at trait bounds on larger structures you can also use trait bounds to specify the generic type implements a particular traits on structs or enums uh, let's look at uh, using a trait uh, using uh, using a trait bounds so first i'll say use the standard module with format with display right nope. okay once i have that i'm going to create a struct of i don't need this this time pair and inside that i'll add t and the value is x of t comma and y of t comma so i create a pair uh, struct here now the implementation of this using t display plus partial uh, odd and I pass the pair structure here and inside this I can implement the function cmp display and pass a pointer to self or pass the address location of self if uh, self dot x is greater than or equal to this is self dot y. I'm gonna say print the largest member is x. If not, I can just say the largest member is y. So this is how you can use like trade bounds to specify uh specify you use like you can you can use this trade bounds here to specify that a generic type implements a particular trait or struct in for, for structures and enums this is how it works next we can look at the type aliases now type aliases allow you to create a new name for an existing type uh, this can be useful for reducing uh, repetition or when working with complex types uh, let's look at a very simple type for now what i can do is i can say type I can just define one say let's say kilometers equal to i32 now kilometers can be in i32 but when I so I'm at creating a parameter of a value let's say 10 I can just say instead of i32 I can say it's type kilometers now x is an i32 but the type alias makes it purpose more clear so you know what it what it will have the value it will have even though it's i32 next uh, the never type the never type which is the exclamation mark is a type that represents the absence of any value in uh, it, and and is used in functions that never return example like we looked at panic we looked at println it has this exclamation mark at the end we have panic which has this exclamation mark so this is kind of uh, represent that the absence of any value uh, and is used in functions like this next uh, is dynamically sized types uh, which is also called dsts and uh, size trait uh, dsts are type whose uh, size is not known at compile time so you don't know the value of those that's why it's called dynamic sized of course the most common dst is str uh, as you as we mentioned earlier like you have a string and you say hello but you can keep on appending more value to it 
Now to handle DSTs, Rust uses size traits to determine whether a type size is known at compile time. By default, generic functions uh, assume types as types are sized, but you can't opt out. Well, you can opt out with uh, something called as question mark size. So for example, I can say generic and I want it to be not sized. So I can just say question mark sized here this way. And inside this, I'll pass the, the rest of the stuff. And you can enter your code here. And this is how you can have the dynamically sized traits uh, for, for generic size. Now, advanced traits and types in Rust provide a robust framework for building reusable, safe, and efficient code by leveraging all the features that we've learned, like associated types, default generic type parameters, trait bounds, type aliases, and others. You can write expressive and powerful Rust code that abstracts over details where necessary while still being explicit and type safe. So if you have any questions on this, uh, leave me comments and I'll get back to you. Thank you. Welcome to advanced pattern matching and control flow in Rust. Now Rust offers powerful pattern matching capabilities that go beyond basic match up expressions, allowing for complex control flows that are both expressive and safe. Now this video explores advanced aspects of pattern matching, including nested patterns, pattern guards, and the if let and while let constructs, illustrating their use with uh, detailed examples. Now mm, let's go over the first one, which is the nested patterns. Now nested patterns allow you to match against complex data structures in a concise way. Let's look at uh, matching of nested enums. So for example, if I have a enum, let's say message, which has as you know, we can have multiple types. I'm going to say quit. Next is move. I think this is one of the examples that we have seen before where I'm going to use x of i32, y of i32 type. I'm going to also have a function here which is write with sticks string as input. Have one more which is change color. And this are i32, i32, i32. So these are three parameters here. So this is my enum. Now let's say if I say message equal to new message and call change color 0, 1, 60, 255, as long as it's under 255. Next, I'm going to say match message. And inside here, I can say message change color r g and b for that let's say printer n change the color to let's say red is this green is this and blue is this and inside here i can give those values r g and b Oh, the wrong things, some deleting. Okay. And then for no options, I can say nothing. So this is how it how you can have like uh, matching of nested uh, nested enums inside here. Now let's look at uh, pattern guards. Now pattern guards add an extra condition to your pattern, allowing for more precise control over uh, the match uh, arm that is selected. So for let's look at an example. I'm going to say let num equal to sum of value four. Now I can say match num. In this case, I'll say if sum is x. Now I'm doing more of a pattern guard here. If x is less than five then I can say println less less than 5. What is the value of it? If I want to print it out, I can just do this and say x is the value. Close it. Next is I can have another one, sum of x. So this will be called if it's anything more than 5. println and inside that, I'll give the value of x. 
and if it doesn't exist also catch that none nothing happens over there so also we can look at if let and while let constructions now you probably have learned, heard about if let in some other programming languages but let's look at both of these now these constructs provide a more concise way to handle patterns that match only one case making the code easier to read and write so let's look at the if let example now let's say if i have some u8 value which is sum and 0 u8 that's how you specify now i can say if let <coughs> sum oops sum uh, 0 is equal to sum u8 value print and then zero so there you go that's how you can use if let now if you want to use a while let i can say let's create a mutable stack which we can go over equal to vector new and inside this i am going to push values get rid of this so we have enough space here push one two and three so send three now using the while let loop i can say sum set top value equal to stack dot pop so i'm stacking values from that print ln get the value here top so this is how you can use while let implementation Next, we can look at uh, matching with the at the rate binding. The at the rate operator allows you to bind a value to a name within a pattern, enabling you to test a value and save it in a variable simultaneously. Let's look at an example. I'm going to get rid of this. Enum message. Let's say hello. Have a value of type ID i32 inside that. And let's create a message which is of the type message and the type hello with a value. I'll have to give a value to ID. Let's give five. And next, let's try to do the match with the at the rate binding in here. So, what I'm going to do is say message hello id is id underscore let's say variable at the rate oh, at the rate three to seven which means from three to seven then what do i want to do with this i want to say print ln found an id in range id underscore variable so it kind of does that binding for this uh, where you can check in a particular range similarly or another thing that i can do is i can say what if it doesn't match right so i can say hello you can just use the same let's use the same one so inside this id but this time i'm going from 10 to let's say 12 found an id in another range and give it the value here i can pass the value but it's fine uh, and another option is copy this inside this so the rest of the things which doesn't go in these range i need to print that found i'll say some other id and print i can print that out if i want but this is how you can use the at the rate bindings for finding in this case more on the range side let's look at next uh, advanced control flow now rust control flow mechanisms when combined with its pattern matching features allows for writing code that is both efficient and easy to understand the compiler checks ensure that all possible cases are handled or explicitly ignored 
why which which helps prevent bugs related to unhandled cases so that's how the advanced control flow works now in this video uh, of advanced match pattern matching and control flow in rust uh, provide a robust toolkit for dealing with complex data structures and control flow scenarios elegantly now by utilizing nested patterns pattern guards if let while let constructs and at the rate binding developers uh, can write concise readable and safe code that is also efficient now these features in, are integral to rush design philosophy uh, it also underscores its commitment to safety and performance without sacrificing uh, expressiveness so i hope it helped you understand advanced pattern matching and control flow if you have any questions uh, do let leave me in comments and i'll get back to you welcome to asynchronous programming in rush now asynchronous programming in Rust enables efficient execution of concurrent tasks, crucial for building scalable systems and applications that perform I/O bound operations like web servers or databases. Now, this video covers the core concepts of asynchronous programming in Rust, including the features, async await syntax, and the executor model uh, with detailed examples. Now, let's look at uh, start with features. A futures the future in Rust is a primitive that represents a computation that may complete at some point in the future. If you've used other programming languages, you'd probably know what I'm talking about. But uh, unlike a blocking operation, a future allows the current thread to continue executing other tasks while the computation is still pending. Now, let's look at a simple example of a future. So the way you create a future is, let's say I want to create a function called as say hello. Now, since it's in this case, we have hello world. Let's say let's start. In this case, since we have specified async here, now this function is marked with async and returns a future. So this future, when awaited, will exec will execute the body of say hello. So it doesn't run immediately, but depending on when it's called, it will run it. Let's look at async await syntax now to understand more on that part. Now the async keyword transforms a block of code into a future that can be uh, paused and resumed, making asynchronous code easier to write and understand. Now the await keyword on the other hand is used to pause the execution of the current future until another future completes, making it look like synchronous code. Let's look at the uh, await future. So for example, have this async function get two websites. So I'm gonna fetch web codes inside this. I'm gonna write entire code. Nope, I will not, but what I'll do why is it okay? Let me just do this. Let I'm gonna get rid of this for now. So it doesn't mess up my keyboard. Future one is fetch site and i'm going to give let's say https let's say www.google.com and i want another one which is let's say bing.com fetch site two so i'm so assume that this fetch site function is an async function that fetches the site's content now let's await both futures uh, to complete. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say let result of one equal to future one dot await. Same thing I'm going to do for two is I'm going to say future two dot await. Now here I will go ahead and print ln say site one response colon question mark result one so what this does is this runs this thing simultaneously synchronously and fetches the data and as soon as it's available it will go and display it here in this particular print align statements Next, we can look at executor. An executor is responsible for running async task to completion. Now, Rush standard library does not provide an executor. Instead, it creates like Tokyo and async std offer these offer their 
own executors and additional asynchronous features. Now let's look at how we can use the Tokyo as an executor. To use Tokyo, you'll typically start by adding it to your cargo toml, and then uh, you can you can spawn task onto the Tokyo executor. Now let's look at how we can actually create a function facing function. Now if you want to use this dependency, you'll probably have to add it to your uh, to your, uh, to your toml file. I'm going to skip that for now, but I'll go directly to this and I'm saying that I'm using that Tokyo here and uh, inside here I'm going to say let future equal to say hello, a previous async function that we had created, which we have, don't have it right now, but this is how you can use uh, an executor. Now next, let's uh, talk about combining asynchronous operations. Now Rust async ecosystem provides several utilities to run multiple asynchronous uh, operations concurrently or in sequence such as futures join uh, for concurrent execution. Now let's look at uh, how that works. So I'm going to use an async, create an async function, get many sites, why just two? And inside that, since I had those code ready, let me just make sure that I have them here. Uh, let's say I want to get from Google, I want to get Bing, and I want to get Yahoo, three different websites I want. And then I can say let result uh, one, actually I can make it a tuple, a result two and result three in a tuple. Get it by doing futures join and pass, make sure that it's never is there future one, future one, future two and future three are in here. So this is how you can like combine asynchronous operations together using the futures join function. And uh, you can print the results if you want after this, uh, one, two, three, and you'll probably have that. Now error handling in async code, it's one of the interesting parts because you need to figure out where the error actually happened. Now handling errors in asynchronous Rust code follows similar patterns to synchronous code. Uh, you can use using result types and the question mark operator within async functions. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go back to the error handling video. Uh, now let's look at an async error handling. So let's say I have a, let's rewrite some of the stuff. Fetch uh, site and it takes a parameter of URL, which is a string and it gives back a result string request error. So this is how you can use that error uh, error handling result uh, object. In here I can say let res equal to request get URL based on what is passed and I can call the await which might have a error. If it doesn't, let's take the text, also add an await next to it. So this is how you can have your code return for handling async, error, uh, async errors. Now from this video, what you learned is like async programming in Rust facilitated by futures and the async await syntax allows developers to write non-blocking code that is both efficient and easy to understand. Uh, by leveraging executors and uh, asynchronous utilities, you can create highly scalable and performant applications. Understanding the pattern uh, and principle of async programming in Rust for working with modern input-output bound and concurrent op applications. So this is what we have learned here. And if you have any questions, uh, ping me up. Uh, you can, you can uh, write comments below and uh, I'll get back to you. Thank you.